Hey guys, I wanted to upload a couple things that we didn't quite have time for in class today. Starting with uh, an example much like number six. A couple of you guys asked me because uh, you were stuck on number six of the inverse function packet and that is very common because it's uh, quite a bit of a harder example. So today we looked at uh, a couple inverse functions. Uh, these ones we did in class today, but I wanted to do one much like number six. So let's say our function h of x is equal to x plus 3 divided by 2x. And really the thing I wanted to um, give you guys some tips on is how do I solve it when there's more than one x or more than one y? Well, um, since we always start by switching um, h of x to y and swapping h x with y, as is the step-by-step -step, uh, for solving and finding an inverse function, so if we interchange y with x, that would leave us with x is equal to y plus 3 divided by 2y. Uh, but th this is exactly uh, what is a little bit more difficult is, well, what happens if I have multiple y? Because what we're set, what we are supposed to do in step three is solve for y. How do I do that? Um, but basically, in an equation where there is more than one y, well, sometimes it's not possible to actually solve for y because many times this function is probably not invertible. In the case of number six and this example, it is invertible. Uh, so it's fine, but that's what I would probably do first is check, well, step one, is it actually invertible? Which, in this case, it is. Um, but anyways, w when you have more than one y, what do we do? Well, we want to try to put all the y's on one side and all the x's on the other side, which is sort of the case, but we're, we're sort of stuck with this fraction. But another general tip for solving an equation that involves fractions, one thing that can be helpful is to clear the fractions from both sides. So what I would do next is actually multiply um, to y to both sides, or cross multiply, however you want to say, which would leave me with 2xy is equal to y plus 3. And now, um, our, our last goal is to, since we're trying to get y by itself, what I would do in this case is put all the y's, every term that has y on one side, and every term that does not have y on the other side. Which in this case, if I just subtract y to the left hand side, that would give me 2xy minus y is equal to 3. Uh, and then the next step, which is not necessarily obvious either, is, well, the only way to get y by itself when I have multiple y's is by using factoring. Like, what we did in today's class was we completed the square. There is no square, so we can't do that here, but here it's a little bit easier because we just have a common factor of y. We could then factor out that y, which would leave us with 2x minus 1 is equal to 3. And we could finish solving this by dividing by 2x minus 1. Since it's y times that whole thing, um, that would be the easiest way to cancel it out. And that would leave me with 3 divided by 2x minus 1. And there we have it. We've solved for y. Uh, and this would then be our inverse function. Since that was h, I'll go ahead and call this as h inverse, which again we represent by using h to the minus 1 power of x for the inverse function. Um, the other thing I didn't have time to get uh, to talk about today in class time is how do we verify that an inverse makes sense? Um, and <coughs> I mentioned that, <coughs> excuse me, that an inverse function should have its domain and range completely swapped, uh, which is one way we could check. Like we could say plug in zero into this function. Well, actually that's not part of the domain. We could say plug in one. Uh, in this case, h of 1, and see what we get. Well, in the original function, we would have 4 divided by 2, which would be 2. So in the inverse function, since this was my input and output, if I plug in 2 into the inverse, it should bring me back to 1, as I was saying, because an inverse function should reverse that. So I plug in 2, that would give me 3 divided by uh, 2 times 3 would be 6 plus 1, Oops, that's supposed to be a minus one, isn't it? Had a little typo for some reason right there. There we go. Uh, and I was about to check and say, okay, why is this not uh, working as I expect it to? Uh, but anyways, when I plug in two here, this would give me three divided by uh, four minus one, which is of course three over three or one. But that, that was my original point, is notice that the domain and range, the input and output, have been flipped, and it will properly invert itself. So the other thing, which is something that I ask you to do in the activity today, is to graph both the function and its inverse on the same graph. 
Uh, and the reason is because in an inverse function, uh, the graph of an inverse will always be symmetric to the original function about the line y is equal to x, or you can imagine it as a 45 degree line. So to draw what that symmetry sort of looks like, basically if we were thinking about a 45 degree line y equal to x going through um, an xy graph, if we have a function which say looks something like this on one side, uh, its inverse will be symmetric about that axis, meaning if I can imagine turning the page and reflecting it across that, uh, it would have the same sort of shape um, just across, reflected across that line. And I wanted to say, well, why? Uh, and, and really it's because of the same reason I was talking about when you switch the domain and range, what impact does that have on the graph? Like say imagining some of the points on this, let's say that that is the point two comma one. If we were to invert that point, what that would do is it would swap the x and the y coordinate, and what that would leave us with is the point 1, 2, which should be on the graph of the inverse. And notice that all that does is it switches the location of x and y, which would direct it across that line y is equal to x. Or say, for example, the point up here, if that because that, my drawing isn't very good there, there should be a corresponding point across the ref axis of reflection over there. So let's just say that that's the point 6 comma 3. There should be 3 comma 6 on the inverse. Again, obviously because that's what the inverse does. It switches the input and output um, and what it will do is create that sort of symmetry. So looking at some of the examples that we did, uh, like say for example we go back to f of x and its inverse x minus which was 4x plus 5 and x minus 5 over 4. If we graph those together we should see that symmetry. So how we can do that is you can just graph them with your calculator and create a little sketch on your paper. You don't have to uh, spend forever uh, doing it because you know we can quickly check with a calculator, but we can see we have 4x plus 5, which is a linear equation, intercept of 5, uh, slope of 4. Um, and if we're looking at the other one, which would be parentheses x minus 5 divided by 4, make sure to use parentheses if you're going to use the uh, division symbol in your calculator because this um, it is like a direct division. It doesn't necessarily know what's on top if you don't use parentheses. And it, um, anyways, we'll talk more about that towards the end of chapter three when we talk a lot about rational functions. But basically, this would be a linear function with uh, slope of one fourth, intercept of negative five fourths. But obviously, I could just graph them both on my calculator. And what we see is they exhibit that sort of symmetry. And what's actually also helpful to do is to also graph the line y is equal to x, because that is what, that's the axis to which inverse functions are always symmetric about. And so it should kind of go right through the middle and accurately show the reflection of those functions. And so, you know, if I were to kind of create a sketch and verify, and in your homework, it's gonna ask you to kind of do this as well. But I can see I have one function here. Um, I have my axis, which is, I'm gonna do it as a dotted line because it's not, it's not actually a graph, it's not part of the function. I guess I'll do it in red. The axis of reflection, y is equal to x, like that. And then uh, my other graph, which connects actually through the axis as well. What you should notice is that the lines should intersect each other um, at, the, at the same point uh, of reflection through y is equal to x because at that point um, we you know that I think that would be the point um, well it's gonna be a fraction which you could solve by setting by equating them setting them equal to each other not important but that's the one point where uh, like say for example 2 comma 2 if it's if it has the point 2, 2 comma 2 if you invert it it's still gonna be 2 comma 2 and it should be the same point on both of them which is why it should intersect through the axis um, but actually what you might be wondering if you're looking at this um, and again, it's kind of small, so let me make it a little, make, make this graph a little bit bigger so you can see it better in the video. Looks like it won't let me go any bigger than that. Um, that so what was I saying? Um, notice it might, it doesn't look exactly symmetric. Like if I'm looking at the graph, they sort of look similar, but it doesn't quite have the symmetry. And I wanted to mention why that's the case with the calculator. Um, and this is because if we actually look at the window in the calculator, it graphs the typical domain from negative 10 to 10 and negative 10 to 10 if we're in a standard viewing window. And actually, notice since it's a rectangle, but the dimensions that I'm using are square, it's gonna skew the graph a little bit. And re really what that's doing is this graph is not 
doesn't have, it's not going to exhibit symmetry as well because of the skewed nature of the axis. And there is a, if there's a super easy way to fix this, um, which is called zoom square. If you go into zoom and you look at number five, what this will do is it'll create a square window. It'll kind of compensate for the rectangular nature of the graphing window on your calculator. Um, and it will, uh, it will be graphically equal on both the X and Y axis. So it's not gonna be the same domain and range on both, but it will now be the proper scaling. So both the X and Y axis will have the same interval, the same distance between the tick marks. And notice that when I regraph it in zoom square, notice the perfect symmetry there. And it, I, like if I were to look at that, and you know, if you turn your calculator 40 degree, 45 degree angle, you'll see it'll be exactly the same on both sides of that 45 degree axis. Also notice the axis now is at an exact 45 degree line due to that compensation. And you know, what we could do is we could do one more. Let's look at G just to make sure uh, that it also is working. Basically, I'm just going to graph them both together just to see. So if I look at G here, I have the, equa uh, the equation square root of 2x plus 3. And then G inverse. And again, what I'm kind of doing here is checking to see, okay, is this the correct inverse? If it is, it must have the, that particular symmetry. Um, and if I go ahead and look at this one, I have x minus 3 squared over 2 as my inverse function. If we look at this, we can see that the first function is the square root of 2x plus 3, and the second is x minus 3 squared over 2. And the reason I brought this one up is because when you, if you're looking at this, notice that there's actually a problem with the inverse function, which is that it's not entirely one-to-one. -one. And this actually brings up an important point about domain, uh, where, where there's so, sometimes with a function you have to make a particular assumption. Like in this case, the original g function that we had there, um, since it's a square root function, its original domain would be from zero to infinity, right? Because at negative values, um, it's going to produce non-real answers. It's not going to be undefined. And the range, uh, since this typically is zero to infinity plus three, would have been three to infinity. But you could have found that out by graphing g in its own window, and I did not do that ahead of time. But the reason why I bring up the domain and range of the g function is that if you, the inverse function should have inverted domain and range. So if we wanted to know, well, what's the domain of g inverse, it will have to be three comma infinity and the range will have to be zero comma infinity. And the reason, um, whoops, did not put that on the screen. And that's just because that's always how inverse functions work. And if I'm actually looking at the g function, technically the domain of this function is all real numbers. So what we kind of have to assume with this inverse is that it's not, it doesn't have its usual domain of everything. We're going to restrict its domain from three to infinity. And the reason I'm bringing all this up is because if I look at the calculator, obviously this is a parabola right here. And we can see, you know, we've got a parabola with vertex three comma zero. Well, technically, I don't want to graph the full parabola. I only want to graph it from 3 to infinity. So this graph is graphing more than it should. And really, I want it to start here and go to the right and basically ignore this part. Now, there is actually a way I can remove that from my graph. And this is something that I is not don't really bother with learning this because this is just basically what I can do is I can set the domain for what I want in my graph to be X is in the test menu there's a set of logical operations which allow you to customize the domain of your thing. If you just put it in parentheses like that, um, I can basically cut off part of it. And what this will do is we'll graph that parabola specifically in the domain that I want it to, from three to infinity. And anyways, my point is notice that it does, it is properly symmetric about it, but there, you know, sometimes the algebraic expressions I get, I just have to understand those implications but again, to sort of try to make this sound simpler, because I know I'm getting into things that I usually don't bother teaching all this because it's, it's honestly not. I mean, it is important when we get into certain types of functions. Basically, some mathematical functions have problems with certain things because parabolas are not one to one. But if we only look at part of it, it is one to one. And we often refer to this as restricting the domain or restricting the range so that uh, we can actually make it work. Because if we didn't, it wouldn't be a proper inverse. But to, to try to simplify this quite a bit, basically, with your original function, if you find its domain and range, 
you know that has to be the, if you reverse them, that has to be the domain and range of the inverse. And that's how you would know how to find the restricted domain and range. And I, I don't think that the homework asks you any of this. So again, it's not something I'm gonna ever ask you about, uh, but it's just kind of, the, in those complicated cases when we're dealing with functions that are not one-to-one, -one, there's often a way that we can still find the answer. And you know, with a square function, a parabola, technically they're not invertible, but if you restrict their domain, we can invert them into a square root, right? Because square rooting and squaring are opposites in a way.